Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. I, I must tell you that this particular issue around the cash has created more heat than light over recent times, so maybe... <laughs> Uh, so we'll we'll start with the the rationale for the for the cash ban. It uh, seems to be the the responsibility of the assistant uh, treasurer Michael Suka uh, at the moment uh, to to basically make the the, the pitch uh, for this. I gave a, a a brief rationale for it, but can can you go into detail? <laughs> well, a bit of history first. So you need to understand that the cash ban. Uh, deposit bail-in and some of the other things that are going on are all an agenda that was cooked up post the G20 meeting back in 2011. So after the global financial crisis, where effectively banks were uh, basically rescued by government uh, putting huge amount of taxpayers' money into them around the world, right? And they concluded they could never do that again. So they've been looking for alternatives if we get into another banking crisis. So the cash ban element shouldn't be seen in isolation. It should be seen as part of a suite of programs. One of the things that was recommended was that effectively uh, we should have more, there should be more controls and uh, the cash thing is part of that story. Now, there was also a Black Economy Task Force that ran in Australia a few years later. That was read, led by KPMG and a few other people. And the Black Economy Task Force basically incorporated the idea of a transaction cash bank. Uh, in their recommendations. And those recommendations were brought into Parliament by Scott Morrison when he was Treasurer. So Scott Morrison is all over this, this bill, uh, as is the G20. So that's the important context. So whenever um, people decide to resist this, we are resisting not only SCOMO, but also the G20. So that's important to understand, right? So the bill was introduced, the cash bill particularly was introduced last year. And uh, the... Uh, Treasury were responsible for propagating it. They actually issued the draft bill on a Friday night at 5.30 p.m. with no, lay, no more than two weeks to put submissions in. And despite that, uh, I think they all hoped that no one would notice, we managed to get uh, 3,500 submissions into Treasury relating to the cash bill. And basically, the bulk of them were actually anti the bill. And we'll talk about why in a second, right? And then... Um, it went into the lower house, so they redrafted a little bit, but went into the lower house. The lower house voted it through in no November time. It then went to the Senate, and the Senate decided to hold an inquiry into the bill. And they, the inquiry received more than two and a half thousand submissions. So in both, you know, normally these submissions, people receive 20 or 30 submissions, vast numbers of submissions, right? And the uh, bill was reported then um, back from the Senate last week with some sort of five or six key recommendations to make changes to the bill. But essentially, the cornerstone is that if those changes were made, it would be potentially actually introduced into law. But what this bill says is that it is not allowable to make any cash transactions above $10,000, period, in Australia. Right? That's what the bill says. And then there's a separate set of regulations that carve out specific exclusions. So, for example, there's an exclusion that says cryptocurrencies are okay at the moment. Transactions between uh, of, of um, up to ten thousand uh, dollars and more are okay in the bank between a bank and <laughs> a consumer and a consumer of a bank. Right. So, but those regulations are not in the bill. Those regulations can be changed at any time by the treasurer just chucking it out and saying, right, we're going to use something different, right? So the bill is, banging, is banning all transactions with more than $10,000 in cash. Now, it's being argued that this is to do with the black economy and uh, tax leakage. Actually, Australia has a very small proportion of its economy uh, that has tax, le tax leakage, and most of the tax leakage is not down at sort of $10,000 cash, it's more to do with multinationals. If you look at the big multinationals who don't pay their tax here, it's billions and billions and billions they don't pay, right? But nevertheless, they've chosen to focus on this, this narrow, narrow element. Now, the point about this is the 
rationale that they put out is it's all about tax leakage and tax minimization and clamping down on bikey gangs. That's what Suka says, right? Who's now responsible, as you said. But if you look carefully, go back to G20, go back to what I said, what, they, what I think they've got is a mechanism that if they needed to, in a crisis, in a banking crisis, they could essentially, if this bill was law, turn off cash withdrawals from banks. In other words, this is a mechanism that potentially has the opportunity of stopping money being whipped out of the banks in a crisis. Now, if you go back to 2008 UK, look at Northern Rock, one of the building societies over there. There were queues of people down the street all whipping out their money out of the Northern Rock because they were worried about its financial stability. Right? They didn't want that to happen again. That's what the G10 is all about. That's what this cash bin bill effectively can be about. So that's what this real agenda is. Now, the, the, the story, therefore, is that you've now got some politicians across the aisle who are very negative this bill and actually believe that it erodes civil liberties because at the moment you can actually use cash the way you want it. Post the bill coming in, you won't be able to use cash in certain ways. Uh, there are also other people who are arguing that it's to do with monetary policy and negative interest rates and all those sorts of things, right? So if you actually are persuaded by just the black economy arguments, the other point to make is that around the world, the cash level has tended to be dropping lower and lower. So rather, it might, it might be $10,000 now, but it could well be dropped lower later as well. In some countries in the Europe where they've got a similar bill, it's 1,000 or 2,000 euros. So this is a way of controlling the money supply, controlling the way we use cash, eroding our civil liberties, and very importantly, building a trap which could be activated in the case of a financial crisis. And that's why I thought it was interesting that it came from the, the G20, because you and I both remember the, the global financial crisis. And uh, after that, there was the, the European banking uh, crisis, uh, which uh, affected uh, Greece and, and Cyprus. And obviously, with people worried about the bank's uh, liquidity is they want to uh, withdraw their money and they, they, they introduce things such as extra bank holidays so that uh, the uh, you, you can't go to the bank and there's a limit on how much you can withdraw from the the ATMs because uh, just to a lot of people in the chat might know this as well we have a fractional reserve banking system where the the, the bank loans out uh, your money that it stores and that uh, gets deposited again and so it only has what is that 10 percent deposit on hand uh, well it depends whether you believe the fractional reserve theory of how banks work right so that's another that's a whole another argument we can go down that route if you want because it's really important to understand that banks have the ability to create unlimited amounts of credit right it's not linked by the amount of deposits they have um, what happens is that they actually can create money out of thin air when they write a loan. Those loans then go and create assets or create deposits. Those deposits then go into the banking system, right? So this whole idea of that the banking system is limited in some way by those ratios and that fractional reserve is not actually, the in, in fact, the way banks work. Banks can grow for as long as people can be persuaded to borrow more from them. The reason why I mentioned it is because this is another reason why both the banks and the governments don't want people to withdraw uh, their money on a mass scale because then the banks go bankrupt and the whole yep. whole fractional reserve system of, of banking collapses. So, so that's right. Banks have to have assets and liabilities. So, you know, the, the loans on one side, the deposits on the other side, deposits and also other forms of funding, for example, bonds and those sorts of things, right? But they have to keep the, the two together. So the more they loan, the more they have to have um, the other side of the balance sheets. Now, if in fact people whip out a whole bunch of uh, uh, their savings from the banks, then their ratios go all over the place and then they can't lend anymore and get into liquidity um, uh, risk areas. And that's precisely the problem with, with this. So in a way, the cash ban is a way of trying, I think, to lock people into the banking system to protect the banks. And that has been ultimately denied again and again by even the Senate's inquiry, refused 
to make that connection. So they're sort of going back to, no, 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 this is all about um, tax leakage and black economy, right? They're missing the, you know, the elephant in the room, which is monetary policy and the need to actually keep people within the banking system. And the real truth is that once you are in the banking system, the only way that you can transact then is digitally. Every time you transact digitally, you create a footprint. And that basically means that you can be tracked. You can, people can understand precisely what it is that you're doing. And, uh, you know, it's a bit like, um, uh, you know, 1984, you know, nothing is, nothing is free. Because if you think about it, cash transactions, you know, it's just notes, right? And there's no audit trail. But if you're actually making payments within the digital system, then you leave, you leave a footprint and that basically leaves open control um, and worse. So that's another angle on this, right? So it's almost a, a strategy to push more and more into the digital world and to lock people into the digital system. And it's about surveillance and supervision and all those things. And in fact, China is a really interesting model because they've taken this a lot further. You know, you have things like social scores there and all those things, but basically the financial system is much more controlled. Than here. But we have a heavily controlled financial system now and the worry about the cash ground is it's just one more step taking away our freedoms again. Yeah, because it's privileging the the banks even more. Which who issues the the banking licenses? It's uh, the government, and of course the 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 big four uh, banks. They want to 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 retain their privileges and make sure that there's no uh, competition. And of course, uh, governments and we have the, the the financial transactions regulator Austrac, who do their credit do uncover some uh, dirty deals uh, by the by the bank. But the government wants the ability, not that they're looking at it all, but the ability to basically go through someone's financial footprint, and it's easier if there's just four banks which people are locked into. Well, there's no doubt that competitive um, dynamics around banking is, is worrying, right? So we have a large number of very small players and a small number of very large players. And in fact, APRA has some time ago said, it's much more convenient if we have all of our financial system in a small number of players that we can easily supervise, right? So, so, so you know, there, there is endorsement, if you like, at the center of large is good and a small number is good, right? When in fact, what, what we should be doing is encouraging significantly greater competition. The margins in Australia even now are a lot higher than most banks around the world. So Australian Inc. is paying very heavily, heavily for our uncompetitive, uh, you know, monopolistic type behaviors from the banking sector. And yet they're protected by government. They're protected by the Reserve Bank. The Reserve Bank has something called the Committed Liquidity Facility, which basically says if banks get into issue in difficulty from a liquidity perspective, the Reserve Bank will support them and help them. And in fact, one of the reasons why the credit ratings of the banks here in Australia are so strong is because there is the belief that the banks will be absolutely supported by the government and by the Reserve Bank. Uh, one of the developments that we've covered here at the Unshackled is the the big banks, uh, primarily uh, ANZ and Westpac, uh, deplatforming de Patriots, shutting down their their bank account in uh, a clause in their their terms of uh, conditions. It's basically for for wrong think and. We have this cash ban coming in. We have, as as you just said, it's a deli it, it, everyone wants there to be these big privileged banks. And so if you get a deplatformed from one of the, the banks for, for wrong thing, uh, that is a, a serious hindrance on basically your, your everyday life to uh, financially trade just to, to buy things at the, uh, the 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 grocery store even if there is a uh, toilet paper the the banks will will cancel your card and obviously the uh stripe and paypal and other payment processes of uh, uh platforms all lots of people for wrong think mainly on the on the right and so this is basically consolidating it more where they uh, 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 they're basically keeping you in line that yeah you can't even go back to cash which is legal tender it says on that well so legal tender today is legal you know and you can tender with it but the cash bill will change that right mm -hmm. and you're absolutely right so, so there was evidence produced in the inquiry for the cash bill of uh, debanking in other words businesses being effectively uh, unable to continue because their banking 
services were being removed by the banks. And they didn't have to give any explanation as to why it was that they were actually um, doing that. There is no civil right to allow you access to the banking system. It is a commercial relationship, it's a commercial decision that uh, the banks make and their argument would be that if it's not commercially sensible for them to do it, they won't do it. And that means, you know, commercially sensible from a profit perspective or from a moral perspective or from a political perspective. So we are already teetering on the edge of effectively the banking system have sig having significant veto control over people being able to live, you know, a re reasonable life. And, and the fact is, if you can't use cash uh, and you are being forced into the banking system, right, you've got no choice, they have control. The other thing, of course, is they can charge you fees. Because if you think about it, if you pay with some of the online systems, then you may have to pay a fee. Or if you have digital accounts, they'll start charging you for them. So this is potentially another earner for the banks as well. So effectively, the more you're forced into the banking system, the more you're playing effectively their game, the more they're going to charge you, the more they're going to be in control, and the less flexibility and freedom we have as individuals. And it's interesting that some of the um, liberals, for example, down in, down in Melbourne, actually uh, have identified this freedom issue as is the critical one. So basically they're saying, this is anti-liberal. This liberals don't stand for this. They stand for individual freedom and flexibility and agility, all those good things. This is precisely the opposite. So effectively you could argue that the Morrison uh, government doctrinally has gone completely off the rails. Yeah, because the, the Liberal Party now uh, does have a, you'd call it a substantial uh, amount of classical liberal libertarian uh, MPs, uh, Tim Wilson, James Patterson, uh, come to mind. And this is the, the ultimate restriction on, on civil liberties, your ability to uh, 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 trade, do transactions in uh, legal tender, but you mentioned there that this was signed off by Scott Morrison uh, when when he was the treasurer. Obviously, Josh Frydenberg uh, is the the treasurer now, and you mentioned the 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 regulations which the treasurer can. Uh, change with the stroke of a pen, and if he's captured by his uh, Treasury uh, Department, uh, the bureaucracy already run the show most of the time, and if they capture a minister, uh, even uh, better for them. Uh, but it just shows that what the when uh, politicians get into to, to cabinet and that uh, uh, Scott Morrison himself talks about the political bubble. Well, he there's this uh, backbench revolt hasn't uh, changed uh, his uh, cabinet's policy on this one iota. No, well, there's actually a very interesting tussle going on. So we know that there are a number of uh, liberals and nationals who are very anti this bill. We also know that some of the Labour Party people are anti. The Greens are against it. One national, one nation are very against it too. But within his own party, there are people who are against it. But um, Morrison, Frydenberg and Zucker have basically um, been holding the line. And in fact, uh, the, the inside talk is that it's Morrison who's saying, no, we must do this. Of course, he's the one who built it, brought the bill in the, in the first place. And it goes right back to the reason is because it connects back to the G20 and the international agenda about um, protecting the banking system from another financial crisis like a decade ago. And of course, the timing on this couldn't be more worrying given where we are over the last few days with all of the um, falls in the financial markets, the pressure on the banking system because of the coronavirus and the fact that probably some of their customers will have difficulty in repaying the loans they've got. I mean, there's a whole bunch of reasons why this is almost a replay of the GFC a, a decade ago from a liquidity perspective. So, so this is really a very, very current issue. Um, and, and, you know, the, the worrying thing here is that many of the politicians have no idea. So even those who in the, voted for it in the, in the lower house, many of them had no idea that the penalty here is t up to two years in jail if you make a cash transaction above $10,000, right? That's the penalty. Uh, that's the most draconian, um, uh, you know, regulation compared with almost everybody around the world with regard to this. So, so the, and they've gone black letter. In other words, it's not about the circumstance. In other words, did you make a mistake? Have you done it several times? Um, it's basically, if you make a transaction more than $10,000 in cash, you can go to jail. Yeah.
Uh, now, uh, there, there would be people who would say, and it sort of feels like they're the old uh, assault rifle uh, argument, why do you need to make uh, cash transactions over $10,000? For example, ATMs, they, the, they only dispense $50 bills, even though we have $100 bills. And whenever we see somebody... A lot of people, when they see someone flash a $100 uh, greenback bill, they sort of, well, how did you get that? Uh, were you up to, up, to, up to something? So why is it necessary for... I, there's obviously the freedom principle argument, but also the practicalities as well. What may you like to purchase for more than 10000 with cash? Well, yeah, so there are some areas. So if you go look up in some of the rural areas, for example, they don't have at the moment the ability to um, use electronic alternatives. So, you know, if they're buying cattle or selling cattle at a market, um, evidently, you know, cash is used quite often for that. It is also used, you know, so that there was actually an interesting evidence uh, uh, argument produced by the funeral directors of Australia who said, you know, it's amazing how many people save for their funeral, you know, notes over time. And then when they, when they die, they turn up with this big bundle of notes to pay for the funeral. <laughs> so there, there are lots of examples where cash is legitimately used. Now, I recognize that there will be a small proportion of people who are using cash for, you know, nefarious means and that sort of, sort of, sort of thing. But there are already regulations today that if they were enforced, would actually restrict those sorts of um, transactions. You don't need another bill to do this, right? You just need the implementation of the, the current legislative frameworks that are already in place. Uh, and Andrew Wilkie in the lower house made the point when he was arguing against the, the bill, said, if you actually had been implementing and policing the current regulations that exist in Australia, you wouldn't need another cash ban bill, right? So, so it's about, you know, is this overkill? And yes, it is. And it, is it to do with this, you know, broader question of monetary and, and, um, and, and control and that sort of thing? Yes, it is. But even if you stand back and just look at it as a single piece of legislation relating specific to tra cash transactions, we know that there are many people who are used cash today quite legitimately. We know that there are many people who prefer to use cash rather than digital. And that's going to probably continue for some time. And there are circumstances, for example, we had the South Coast where we had the bushfires and all of the ATMs, net, ATM networks and all of the um, FPOS machines went offline for weeks. The only way you could buy anything in those areas was using cash. Right. So there is a very, very important role for cash, even in a case of emergency. Um, and so I think that we need to be very careful, not just to sort of be bounced into this very, very draconian environment where effectively cash is now illegal in certain circumstances. And if people are engaging uh, illegal in illegal activities with uh, transactions over over ten thousand, uh, are they suddenly going to think, "Oh, I better not engage in this illegal transaction now because uh, now the, the 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 cash transfer itself would be." illegal, which goes to your point, of course, uh, uh, agencies, uh, law enforcement, they're always wanting extra power, not because it will help them catch them, but it's basically they, they just want it there in case. Well, there's no doubt. Yeah, there's no doubt that there is this sort of quest for power. And in fact, you could, you could list a whole bunch of regulations over the last five years that have taken away more and more of our freedoms. Look at some of the digital um, changes that were made. Look at some of the uh, digital identity. Look at the... Um, the credit scoring system that's now in that you know so so little by little our freedoms are being eroded and, and frankly i'm worried that we're just sleepwalking into you know a nightmare solution into the future where effectively every action that we take everything that we spend our money on is controlled and managed at the center and i'm very worried by that and i think that's something we should be resisting right First point. Second point is this $10,000 limit thing, right? That's just a number plucked out of the air because the Treasury in their, in their um, evidence to the Senate said, well, we, you know, we didn't quite know where, the, where to set it. We picked it because it was a convenient level, mm. right? Because it's the same as the Oztrack one. But like I said earlier on, around the world, typically the cash ban limit gets dropped, right? One to 2,000 euros. In other words, not 10,000, but $1,000. Right. What would happen if it was $1,000? Think how restrictive that would be 
in terms of you know just day-to-day -day transactions so so the difficulty is that this is the thin end of the wedge and yet you know frankly many people have been I think are ignorant of this. I'd also say that the mainstream media have hardly covered this at all. Ah, oh, yeah, they've been a disgrace on it. And uh, we just saw yesterday Australian Associated Press uh, announcing their their closure, and the, all these people sobbing on Twitter that uh, we won't get uh, impartial, important news anymore. But they've complete. There's been a report here and there, but there has been in no way a a right. A, write up about how significant uh, if this bill passed it would it would be it's just like oh the uh the senate uh, committee is considering this it's it's just sort of uh basically page page 12 of the of the paper yeah well there's a few things to say there abc did do a, a, an article a few months ago but the journalist who did it got into terrible trouble because basically she took a stronger position than uh, the, the, than people wanted her to take um other than that, there's a guy called Aaron Patrick over at the AFR who's written three very, very disgusting articles, basically accusing, uh, you know, this being a right-wing plot. Um, in other words, should let, 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 let the cash ban come in. It's make perfectly sensible. Um, anybody who's resisting it is, you know, a right-wing, um, you know, plotter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but of course, the AFR is the, um, you know, the public organ of the um, the banking system, so wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, Although I actually, I think I may have mentioned this, Alan Jones did do a very good piece on Sky uh, yesterday where he basically was talking to Malcolm Robertson from the um, uh, the One Nation Party who's resisted it. And um, Alan was right on song, highlighting all of the risks and issues around this and talking about you know civil liberties and talking about the issue of being trapped in the banking system and talking about the lack of um uh, civil liberties that effectively is, this would this would lead us to and you know kudos to him he finally he's kind of finally got got on song it's just six months too late yeah alan uh, when he when he does get on to a an issue such as this which is ignored by the the mainstream he's incredibly uh effective they they, they talk about uh, his uh his power is uh, overstated uh, his his enemies but uh, he has uh, led some important campaigns uh, over the years and well better better late than never well, you know, the more the merrier, right? And uh, the, the, the other interesting thing is we've got quite a few people internationally who are watching what's happening here in Australia. So there are some uh, very, very famous people who are now engaging <coughs> around this. And some of the posts that I've done on Walk the World, which is my YouTube channel, um, we've had a whole big audience, um, you know, 80, 90, 100 and something thousand uh, of people around the world and a lot of interest because this battle is actually not just representing Australia and Australians, but it's also a battle which potentially is going to be played out elsewhere around the world because this G20 logic is not just for an Australian banking system, it's for every banking system around the world controlled by the central bankers, controlled through the G20, controlled by the Financial Stability Board. And so other countries are watching with interest to what extent we, we battle this. It's also worth saying, Germany tried to put this bill in about four or five years ago and ultimately it was rejected because one of the main papers, the newspapers in Germany came out against it and basically ran a very effective campaign and it was derailed. Most other places across Europe have this legislation in place now. And, you know, it is very interesting to see that in other countries where it's not yet in, but there is talk about it being brought in, Australia is being held out as a bit of a case study. Uh, will the cash ban apply to uh, political donations in Audi bags? <laughs> no, politicians are exempt. Yes, because uh, when uh, we've seen constantly when when they're caught uh, with their expenses, they say, "Oh, it was technically within the rules or or guidelines." I, I get confused what's the difference between rules and and guidelines. And everyone rightly points out that if we uh, did that, uh, we'd be before the courts. Yep, no, there's one rule for them and one rule for everybody else, right? The fact of the matter is that there are specific carves out in the bill, right? So any, anybody in the political environment, any, anything in, in public life, basically, no, you can do whatever you like. Really? That's actually, I was just making a joke, but that actually is in there. <laughs> 
It is, absolutely it is, oh. it is, absolutely it is. And so basically, if you are, you know, a small business, right, or if you're an individual and, you know, you actually want to pay in cash over $10,000, you won't, you won't be allowed to. But if you're in a political party or if you're in the, you know, political establishment, not a problem. Oh. Another thing has come to mind, uh, when the, the good guys, the electrical retailer launched, uh, their, their slogan was, uh, pay cash and we'll slash the prices, because obviously there's no merchant uh, fees there. And I remember this was way, way back in, in 2008, when I bought my, uh, my first uh, flat screen H uh, HD TV, I, I paid for, for that uh, uh, in cash. So I guess uh, that sort of uh, deal where you uh, both the the good guys uh, in in both senses of the word uh, that sort of uh, deal cutting out the middleman is is going to be gone well if it's over if you're getting a tv that's over ten thousand dollars well it, no that's the whole point so basically the idea is that people do pay cash sometimes and it's a negotiating ploy right because you can actually sometimes get a better deal because as you said there are no merchant fees that uh, that need to be paid now the argument that the other side will put is well if you're paying cash just you know let's say you have a tradesman turn up and fix your roof right and you offer to pay cash um, does that tradesman then actually declare that revenue um, when they when he does his accounts but my argument is that's not that's not the person who's paid's problem that's the tradesman problem right because basically you are policing effectively um you know one thing to try and solve another problem clearly if the audit and account of that particular business is done right then that would be picked up so so trying to effectively put the acid back on the individual um for something which is relating to the way that the tradesman work, runs his own business to me is mis is misplaced uh, you mentioned that the, the cash ban doesn't apply to, to cryptocurrencies, which are completely uh, decentralized. So uh, the Oztrack, uh, e even if they wanted to, it's, it's, it's a lost cause. Uh, but uh, before we had crypto, there was the, as they're called, the, the gold bugs, uh, because uh, if you or had stocks in gold or actually had uh, gold and precious metals because it guards against inflation. Uh, gold always always goes up, but there have been instances in the past where, where governments have actually banned gold. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, during uh, Great Depression, World War II, uh, did that. Uh, what is the, the, the status of, of that in Australia, precious metals? Yeah, it's a good question. And, uh, you know, there is an act in Australia, the 1959 Act, which says that the government can confiscate gold at any time at any price. So just put that in the back of your mind, right? So basically, the, what, the, what it says is that um, uh, if you're using gold for, um, uh, you know, things like jewellery and those sorts of things, that isn't included. But if you're using it as a medium of exchange, in other words, actually as a currency, potentially it could be caught. There is no clarity at the moment in the legislation precisely about that. The carve out, so those regulations, it sort of mentions it a little bit, but not specifically. And it's not my view, it's, it's not very clear as to whether gold is or isn't included. Cryptos, uh, at the moment, it is carved out. And they basically said, well, at the moment, cryptos is relatively small as a proportion of total transactions. So therefore, we'll exclude it. But they left the door open that if cryptos, cryptos start to take off, then they can apply the same transaction ban to cryptos as they can to other types doesn't need to change the law because the crypto is actually in the regulation which can be uh. changed by the treasury at any time so cryptos aren't safe i don't think gold is safe uh, and other precious metals and uh, you know it is just showing you that this is you know tentacles getting around lots of different parts of society uh, well if the, if they can confiscate your gold at any time do they have to uh provide monetary comp uh, compensation or do they just at whatever price they want so that's similar it's to not a, it's it's not at a market price thanks for tuning in to wilmsfront visit timwilms.com or rational rise tv to view the archive of episodes and keep visiting the unshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis